I'm very pleased to have uh, Chi Chang Tong, who is a new member of Echo Broadway, and talk about complex things. Is it good? Yeah, all right. Thank you for inviting me to give a talk here. And today I'm going to talk about this complex polytopes in just some kind of points S in RD. And this is a joint work with my PhD advisor, Boris Book at Carnegie Mellon University. All right, and we have this, we have this backup, um, we have this background setting that every finite point set we mention, if without further specific, spec, uh, for, without further specification, this is the uh, in general position, meaning that no planar, no coplanar uh, top of many points. So I will begin with uh, some history of the famous. Average Sepage problem. So what is the problem? <coughs> we define the smallest we define the smallest integer big N, which is a function of N that such that this many points in the plane, then we must see a convex angle. So before going further, I just want to, I just wonder how many people are familiar with this kind of problem, so-called happy ending problem. <laughs> not many, not many hands on, so maybe I should be <laughs> slightly slow. So this problem was proposed by Mrs. Sekish. And of course, the, I didn't write a question mark. So the first question should be, does n exist? Right? And if yes, how big? This should be the second question. But as you see that I put this second question on the board, so probably the answer is yes, right? <laughs> but otherwise, what's the point of writing this? And why do I call it happy ending problem? Because I think that if I remember correctly, this person asked this question, and then Erdős and Sekres heard this problem. And then they give a solution showing that L exists. And then this sector and that sector <laughs> married together. And so this is not <laughs> happy ending. And the reason this is yes, because we have a famous cup cap argument. So what is the cup what is the cup cap argument? First, I need to draw some pictures to show you what is a cup and what is a cap. So for example, this is a four cup. And this is a five cup. So it's just, it's just a, a sequence of points in the plane such that the, <coughs> such that the slopes increases or decreases. Is that clear? And then what Erdős and Sekers proved is that the Ramsey number of a K cup and an L cup. is exactly k plus l minus 4 choose k minus 2. Uh, maybe plus 1, depending on how you depending on how you how you define this Ramsey number, right? This many points guarantee either a k cup or an l cap. 
And minus one is that is the is the biggest possible size of a set that avoids these guys and these guys. Okay, and we observe that every convex polygon can be partitioned into a cup union a cap. Right? So this theorem tells us that the big N of N is upper bounded by, well, roughly speaking, is upper bounded by 2N choose N, which is roughly 4 to the N. So this is the first non-trivial bound. on this quantity nn we just defined. However, this happy ending problem is still a biggest or even a central problem in discrete geometry because up to today, like how many years? Um, roughly 90 years later, we still do not know the correct answer of this n to the n, uh, n, sub, uh, n of n. And the conjecture, this is also due to Erdős and Sepesh in the same paper, is that they guess that this is exactly 2 to the n minus 2 plus 1. And the reason they guess, they guess this is because they have a construction that seems very plausible. I'm not going to show all the details, but roughly speaking, what's happening in their construction is that we, so we want to construct 2 to the n minus 2 many points in the plane, <laughs> such that no n of them are in convex position. And we first break this many points into clusters of size of these bi binomial coefficients. <coughs> and then for each, for each cluster, we just put it somewhere around this convex curve. And indeed, every cluster is super small. Is that uh, in comparison with the pairwise distance between clusters. And definitely, there are some detailed structures in every, stru uh, in every cluster, but I'm not going to show you that much detail. And this construction seems very plausible, and that's why <laughs> people tend to believe that this is the correct answer. But I can tell you a, a little bit more funny thing is that um, just last semester when I was in Budapest uh, with some other co-authors, we proved the result that this construction is tight, meaning that you cannot add one point into this construction without generating a convex angle. But this sounds like this sounds like crazy because this conjecture has been here for this many years that it is not known in the literature that people previously showed even this original construction is tight. Because the, the same thing you want to ask is that can I say add a point here such that this is still n gone this is still n gone avoiding. If that's true, then the then the, the conjecture is, is immediately defeated. Uh, this proved. So can you say why this is a cons good construction? Is it because you can you have to choose three from one bundle, or um, if you pick endpoints, then or is it? Uh, I don't want to go to that details because I mean it's not super complicated, but it's still because. To explain, you need to know the structure inside this cluster. Um, ah. To explain that kind of structure, it's like this is actually some kind of uh, cup cap avoiding set, ah. and it's hard to it's hard to compose points from different clusters to to get a convex angle. But there are more details and kind of away from what we're, what we are going to talk about today. 
Yeah, but sadly, this four to the n has been the correct order of magnitude, uh, or maybe the, the known order of magnitude for like 80 years until until there was the breakthrough. by Andrew Souk that this is so I think this is the first non-trivial result saying that the correct order of magnitude is 2 to the n plus some some error term, but, but actually the error term is still huge because this is on the exponent, not on not like 2 to the n plus 100, something like this. Yeah, and later this was slightly this was slightly improved by uh, Holmesen and some other authors saying that. This is but, uh, do I remember correctly? Okay, let me double check. I should be late to book. So this is all we know about this happy ending problem, or this n to the n function. And right, and the and the motivation of our study is that. So look at this picture. These are these are points in the plane such that some of them are close to each other. Some pairs are close. Other pairs are super far away. Say a point here and a point there. They are very far away. And so the question is, if we do not allow such a yield behavior point set, so what we want to see is like some roughly evenly distributed points, maybe like this, instead of this, then should it be true that this exponential bound will be will be brought down to a polynomial bound. Roughly speaking, this is the motivation of what we are doing. Plain formal, I give this definition. For every point set in d dimensional Euclidean space, I define I define the normalized diameter of a point set as the max pairwise distance over the minimum pairwise distance. we can ask the similar question.
So it means that <coughs> every endpoint set in R to the D such that the normalized diameter is upper bounded by some constant times the dth root of square of n, we must find some large com uh, large convex polytope. Maybe I should use polytope here because this is in R to the D. And of course, the first question you are wondering is that why do I have this alpha times d uh, alpha times dth root of n? Because this is not something one can see immediate. So the question is, is it possible that um, the normalized that the, nor norm the normalized diameter of this point set tends to zero? And you may think about it, and the answer is relatively obvious, and the answer is no. Because what we have is a set that, some, that is, in some sense, like a grid. But if you are, you are in a grid, then the relative diameter, or no, no the, the normalized diameter cannot be like arbitrarily small, right? Or actually, it is lower bounded by 1. But if you think about slightly carefully, this, is, this has some, some lower bound that grows to infinity as n grows. So the real technique here is that is that we place a disk. Uh, I mean, in this picture I drew in the plane, but a, an open ball in general R to the D. And this disk is a radius one half, so it's this one half. And if I assume that this guy is 1 with a loss of generality, then the disks I drew has to be pairwise disjoint. But on the other hand, if I start from here, just an arbitrarily fixed point in our point set P, and I draw a, a big disk, maybe this, of radius diameter p plus 1 half, then this big disk has to contain all these small disjoint disks. And by that, we have, so this picture tells us that <coughs> the volume of this boss is upper bounded by the volume of the big ball. So this is P and this is BP. And this implies that N times some constant one half to the D is upper bounded by and by solving this inequality, we see that the normalized diameter is lower bounded <coughs> by d through of f. So this explains why we care about this alpha times this root of n. Because this is the first non-trivial case. If the normalized diameter is even smaller, then there's nothing. Because such a, such a point set does not exist. And this is not interesting. survey the previous results on this problem.
So this problem was first studied in the plane by this group of authors, <coughs> where they proved that the quantity is lower uh, is lower bounded by n to the one fourth, and is upper bounded by gamma times. Oh, sorry, no. by roughly one n to the one third, but with some exponential error term. And then both of their bonds were improved by Walter. So this is beta alpha times n to the one third. that there is an extra assumption, which is alpha is bigger than 4. And here, alpha is bigger than 1.06. <laughs> so definitely, there definitely should be some kind of lower bound on alpha, because because alpha is some, something from here, and it's obvious that alpha cannot be 0. So it, it has to be lower bounded by something. is like these group of authors, they proposed this problem and they got some immediate bonds. Well, well actually not immediate. This is still non-trivial. And then both bonds were improved by Walter in, like 30 years ago, and the bond he got is tight in the plane. And what we did is to generalize Walter's results to arbitrary dimensions. And we still get uh, asymptotically sharp bonds. I want to make some remarks is that, so you see that this beta is, de so beta is depending on alpha, but this gamma is not depending on alpha. Because this gamma, because we just made some, we just made some construction for the, for the smallest, for the smallest possible alpha we, we can, then we just carelessly generalize to, to like bigger alphas. So I believe that if people, do calculations or getting some new ideas, then this dependence on alpha <coughs> should be should be thrown in, and then should, and then you should get some better bounds. But at this moment, we care about the asymptotics. We care about the order, and we are less careful about this constant. Do you have a do you have a different range for alpha? The alphas for the upper and lower bounds, or is it? No, nothing else is known. Well, I mean, if you if you think about if you think about this or the results from Suk and the other group of authors, you may see that This, I, I didn't define it, but hopefully you understand what I'm saying here. R of n is mm. 
So, so if R is if R grows larger and larger, then we will run into this kind of pictures, and this tells us that the, the bond is supposed to be logarithmic. And what we're investigating is the smallest possible normal uh, normalized diameter. And under this circumstance, we have this kind of polynomial bonds. Right. But nothing in between is known. Can we just see the definition of uh, board again? I'm sorry? Can we just see the, the board of the definition again? I think it's behind. Ah, the definition of of C, right? Yes. So it's the it's the biggest it's the biggest size of a convex polytope you will that is guaranteed in such a diameter restricted point set. And for some <coughs> very brief proof ideas, what I can say here is that all these lower bounds are proved by some kind of uh, probabilistic method. And for, for this upper bound here, this is like a random grid perturbation. And Walter got smart got smarter and he applied a Wharton grid perturbation. And this is generalized to oscillator grid perturbation. I haven't defined what is a Horton set and what is an oscillator, but I will explain briefly later. At this moment, what we can see is that the lower bounds are deduced from just some standard probabilistic argument. And the upper bound is, is actually more interesting in this problem. And you can see that the, the obvious uh, random perturbation of grids will not give you the, the correct bound. But something interestingly I want to remark is that during our research, we first tried to generalize this random grid perturbation because we, we assumed that this will still give us the correct thing here with some, some small error term on the exponent. But it turned out that, the, that we failed to generalize that <coughs> argument. And because we failed to generalize that argument, we, need, we turn to see if there's a chance to, to generalize this seemingly more complicated one. And after a long time of struggling, we finally succeeded. So that's why we have this result. to explain the technique behind the lower bound. But before that, are there any questions? No questions. OK, so let's move on. So how to deduce such a lower bound? So we think about our P like something that, that is seemingly regular. And what we're going to do is to hit this P by some, by some good <coughs> geometric figure. And by a good geometric figure, what I mean is
is a ball, or but I can only draw a two-dimensional picture. So this is a this is a disk with a bunch of with a bunch of caps inside. But this cap is not the convex cap I I talked about at the beginning. Okay, so the idea is to is to hit this set by a copy of this geometric figure. And if we have many non-empty intersections, then these points will form a convex polygon for us, or a convex polytope for us. And the reason these points are in convex position is that for each point here, this line serves as a separating line or in higher dimensional in higher dimension separating hyperplane to separate this line from other point uh, from this point to other points. And so as long as we can find a bunch of points in these spherical caps, we are happy. All right, and then the thing is to choose this parameter because I didn't show you the parameters here, right? So the thing, and then the thing is to choose these parameters correctly. So, so what I'm what I'm writing here is in R two, and for people who are interested, you may want to check whether this works. So, I want a height. this large, and I want the radius to be exactly <coughs> what we want for the uh, normalized diameter. And then with this set of parameters, we can find This many is spherical caps. And what we are going to show is that <coughs> when this configuration is randomly rotated and shifted around this set. So I'm not specifying what I mean by around, but you can imagine that I'm not going to, I'm not going to put this picture like here. I'm going to put this picture here so that it can hit many points. to establish such a probabilistic uh, estimate. Um, with this probabilistic lower bound here, I can run a first moment method to argue that with high probability, uh, not with, with non-trivial probability, there is such a configuration around P so that a constant proportion of these spherical caps are intersecting this P. And so we can run what I claim here to find a large convex polygon. And this z means shifting. And this rho means rotation. <coughs> yeah, I think this is the, the level of details I'm going to explain here. And hopefully, people vaguely understand what's happening here. And people tend to believe that if we sit down and work on it for like maybe one day or three days, you can figure out. You can, uh, this kind of detail is, is doable. Now let's 
let's turn to the more interesting upper bound. Oh, by the way, a comment here is that <coughs> this is basically Walter's argument in two dimensions. But things work sm smoothly in the higher dimensions. Along, the, well, you just you just pick these parameters in a you know, different scale, but everything else works uh, perfectly good in higher dimensions. All right, and then for this upper bound, we begin with the so-called Horton set. So a Horton set is. Many, you, you just think about many points in the plane without a seven convex hole. So of course, the first question is, what is a seven hole? And this can be think, this can be thought as a as an immediate next problem of the error to cyclish happy ending problem. Because that problem asks for convex n gone. But here I'm asking for not only convex n gone, but convex n gone without anything inside. So for example, what I drew is a five hole. But if we have a, some point here, then this is not a seven, not a three hole. And just as before, people may wonder, like, is it possible to prove that if you have many, many points, then you can find an arbitrarily large hole? But unfortunately, the answer here is no. And the reason is that Horton constructed, constructed some sets such that he can have arbitrarily many points, but there is no seven hole. And the idea of the construction is like this. Well, it's an inductive construction. And I will illustrate to you like one single step of the induction. So let's think about we have a Horton set here, and we want a larger Horton set. So how to deduce a larger Horton set? I first draw these vertical lines in the middle, and then I take a copy of my original set and move it vertically straight until very high above, such that I have a new set here. And this is one single step of the inductive construction of this point set. And formally speaking, by Horton, I mean odd Horton plus even Horton. Plus odd is above or below even. So the point of these sets are forbidding seven hole is because you cannot find a it's because they are for they are forbidding they are forbidding large cup and cap. So you may think about having this kind of picture is hard. And that's why there is no seven hole. <coughs> so is this seven tight like Yeah, this seven is tight. So you, but whenever you have a many points, you have a six hole. You have a six hole, but that is also <laughs> very non-trivial. I think that is proved in 2008, around 2008. So, in you know, a long time, this is an open problem between six and seven because you can easily prove that you can have uh, when you have like ten or nine points in the plane, you will have a five hole. But the six is very difficult. Yeah, but I 
just want to make a remark that the same question, but in higher dimensions, is a wide open problem. Because this 7 is tight in two dimensions, but in higher dimensions, this is like the lower bound is linear, but the upper bound is exponential. And the best known result is due to, it's also Boris Book and my academic brother, Tim Wei Chao. They have a paper uh, saying that the upper bound is exponential rather than super exponential. The point of introducing this kind of Horton sets is because we want to exploit some kind of nice property of, the, of these kind of sets. And I call it, the, I call it empty convexity. So formally speaking, if I have a convex P, inside this, Horton set. Let me use different notations. So assume that we have a k-gon inside the Horton set P. Then we need to pay some cost. And the cost is actually fairly large. Is that the P is lower bounded by some exponent. And why is this true? Because if we think about it, uh, so let's think about a k-cup inside the Horton set. And a, a convex set is, a convex k-bound is not very different from a k-cup, you just lose a factor of two. But the k-cup in our Horton set <coughs> is that maybe drawn like this. <coughs> or maybe this. But the point is that if I look at these middle stuffs, so we don't care. So we don't care about the start and the end, but we care about the middle part. And the point is, the key observation is that the middle part has to be in the same group. So there's no way such that we have a cup like this, because, because the odd is high above the, uh, the even. And for this reason, we have this kind of exponent lower bound on the size of P. What do you mean by the middle part? Is, is, <coughs> are you just taking so every some, some interval of the beginning and end? Or? So no, I'm just I'm just forgetting about the first and the last. The first and everything one. else has to be either in the top or in the bottom. Or otherwise we will run into that picture which is not a cup. Mm -hmm. how, how many vertices say in each layer of the Horton graph? I'm sorry. How, how, can, how, can say, how many vertices say in each layer? Half. Half and half. Because, so if I have a Horton set of size n, then <coughs> this is n over 2, and this is n over 2. Because the construction is like inductive. And so you may think about the Horton set start from one point, and then two points, and then four points, eight, uh, eight points, and 16 points, and so on. <coughs> All right. 
And finally, I'm going to oops, sketch Walter's construction. And to tell you the, the idea of this, this kind of construction. So, we start with a Horton set. And the first step is to squeeze it down. <coughs> so, by squeeze it down, I mean I apply some linear transformation like. <coughs> this, so that the height is very small, and then the Horton set is no, uh, so if you look at this set from somewhere distant, then this is roughly like, a, like the x-axis. So I call this x, and then I have x here, and I have a copy of x namely y here. And then I consider the Minkowski sum, x plus y. So so what we have is, uh, still, if you look at this picture from somewhere far away, then this is roughly the grid. But if you look at very close, you will see that each point is slightly away from the supposed place of that grid point. And also a remark here is that if you care about the details, then this is the, if I call this kind of thing a delta squeeze, then this y is a delta square squeeze. So the level of squeezedness is not the same. It's actually, y is much more flat than x. And I define this. I define this set. Well, the reason I use letter G is because this is like a perturbed grid, because I just explained that every point is very close to the presumably supposed place of that grid point. And so there is a there is a natural bijection between this a perturbed grid to the regular grid, which is defined as bracket n times bracket n. OK, now if we look at a convex polygon in this G tilde, then we are going to investigate the pre-image of this convex polygon in G. And it happens that what we have in G is a picture like this. have in G is that we have a we have a convex polygon. But this is not exactly a convex polygon because we allow extra point we allow extra points on the edges. So if we do so if we do not have these extra points on the edges, then this is too good to be true because that means we have a because that means we can bound the number of vertices by by this length, and that is too good to be true. Yeah, but even we have this, even we have this point on on the edges. This turned out to be not a big problem for us, because this property tells us that 
along each hash, there cannot be too many uh, points. So this is upper bounded by log n because of that. And so the picture right, let me use this place for otherwise this picture will be covered. So the picture immediately tell us that the size of P is upper bounded by n times log n, uh, some constant. Wait, sorry, no. n to the one third times log n. And where I, where I got this n to the one third is because if I have a, if I have a, hmm, how do I say? If I have a convex polygon in square root n times in the square root n by square root n grid, then the number of its edges is upper bounded by n to the one third, and this can be seen by by doing some kind of by doing some kind of uh, basic number theory. So the point is that. The point is that for each such edge, it has a normal vector. And the normal vector is usually is the, the, the multiplicity of each normal vector is upper bounded by 2. Because you cannot have three edges that are parallel to each other. And so if I have many edges, then the normal vector gets bigger and bigger. And if I count, the, if I count the, the summation of these lengths, then because the normal vector uh, gets bigger and bigger, the length gets also bigger and bigger. But the length is upper bounded by this length. And so we expect some non-trivial bound on the number of edges. But this non-trivial means you need to do some kind of calculation. And if you carry out all the calculations, you see this. I mean, unfortunately, I do not have time to explain details of the generalized proofs in RD. But basically, you can imagine that I'm still doing, some, doing this kinds of perturbation. But the thing is that here I'm, I'm studying these edges. But in higher dimensions, I will need to study facets. And the facets turned tur out to be essentially more complicated than these edges. And the way to get, get around it is to still look at still look at these edges, uh, or look at lines, because our Horton constructions, uh, or oscillators, which means higher dimensional Horton sets, will be constructed along lines. And then, from a line to this facet, we, we need to apply something called discrete drawn uh, theorem. And then by put all these ingredients together and some fancy inequality trick, I can prove that, well, first, this is a, there, there is a logarithm term, but with some careful inequality trick applied to, uh, to this scenario, I can get rid of this. And similarly, in higher dimensions, with some, some fancy inequality tricks, I can get rid of all those unpleasant terms to get the correct answer. So I think that's it for my talk. Um, questions are welcome. Thank you. For the higher dimension, did you do the I mean, more Minkowski, Minkowski sum for the p prime axis? Yeah, yeah, I have. So I have d. So I need to have a delta squeeze, a delta square squeeze, and, and all the way until delta to the d squeeze. Well, maybe maybe not exactly delta delta square because I I cannot remember exactly, but I need some kind of like 
a fast decay of this of this greasiness. And yeah, I need to I need to add uh, add all the things up, and then I need to uh, apply another perturbation so that everything is in general position. Okay. And then it's kind of easy. Uh, it's kind of easier in R two. It's like if you check carefully, then this one already gives you a point set in general position. But in higher dimensions, you need to add one more perturbation so that everything is in general position. Yes? Does number of fast, uh, maximum fast sets in n times d yes. is O to the n to the d minus 1 over d plus 1? Yeah, that's uh -huh. true. Yeah, that's also the, like the, I think the first, uh, the first motivation or the first intuition for us to, to prove such kind, such kind of bonds. Yes? If we assume a relaxed condition for the normalized diameter rather than scale D, then st st can, can he still get the polynomial bond or? Mm, I don't know. I think I think that's an interesting question to to me. So, you mean that to to lift the normalized diameter to something higher, right? Yes, yes. I think it's possible, but it's still <coughs> it's still awaiting investigation in the future. Yes. Do you know the um, normalized? Diameter that you need in order to get the other bound to work, the, um, the construction of um, the shared at the start with the uh, exponential. Wait, sorry? What? Do you know how many, uh, what normalized uh, diameter is required for the first construction you showed with the exponential number? To, um, I think on. Um, ah. I think it's supposed to be 2 to the n, but I'm. Yeah, I, I think there. <coughs> I think there is some paper. Uh, there is some paper on that, but I. I do not remember exactly. Yes. Um, I'm guessing that that n to the square root of uh, d root is kind of from uh, placing points in cubic way. I mean, points on <coughs> coordinate, and then you. See Growing like n to the d power. Yes. And but actually, point uh, you can place balls more condensely by. Oh, you mean the you mean the the densest spherical packing, right? Yes. Does it? Yeah. That's that's how we that's how we got the alpha greater than or equal to two bound, because if you think about this problem, but only with this normal, with the standard grade. Then the alpha will, then the lower bound on alpha will be something that that goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. But if you apply the knowledge of people on the densest spherical packing, then you can get a you can get a constant bound like two. Uh, is there like a particular dimension where your bound get better, <coughs> or like sometimes you have this kind of proof, maybe? Because uh, you may, you are, is, I, I mean, what I'm, what I'm curious is like whether there's a particular dimension where your bound can be improved. Mm -hmm. Just for sphere packing, you have uh, some. Yeah, I numbers. understand, but uh, but we are unaware of that we, because for that part, we just cite the existing bounds from spherical packing area and then uh -huh. apply it here to get the uniform lower bound too. Mm -hmm. But you see, you s if you remember, then. It's like Walter's, uh, what Walter got was like 1.06 because there's still some kind of variation. Yeah, but it's just, for us, not, not something looks super interesting to, to work further on this kind of bounds. Any other questions? Uh, if not, let's thank the speaker.